Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome to Wellness on Wednesday. These are informational and fun and interesting series of dedicated uh, information dedicated to promoting walking as a powerful tool for improving your health and reducing arthritis and joint pain. We're so delighted to bring this free series of virtual health talks to you um, in connection with the esteemed Rochester Clinic and Lotus Health Foundation. I'm Denise Stiegel. I am the curator at livinghealthylist.com and your host for the Wellness on Wednesday series. So if you don't know much about Rochester Clinic and Lotus Health Foundation, let me tell you that they are truly their focus. They have a strong focus on community, the community well-being, um, and they're truly at the forefront of spreading this series um, to the world. Um, this amazing group of people, they talk about um, whole food, whole food plant-based nutrition. We're going to talk about physical activities and all of the things that will help you improve arthritis health. And these programs are brought to you by, like I said, Rochester Clinic and Lotus Health Foundation, because it is their desire to help you live your best life. Uh, now, we can't forget, we want to thank Let's Walk Minnesota, which is a campaign sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health and funded by the Center for, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And it's because of them they re that we really are able to um, bring this initiative forward to you. Uh, so I mentioned discovering uh, through this presentation or these series of presentations, you'll discover um, the incredible potential of walking um, and provide insights on how to enhance your quality of life. Because that's really what we want. We want quality in our life. And how are we doing that? We're doing that through movement, through nutrition and lifestyle medicine. So today we're really excited to talk to Dr. Uh, Amy Robotin. Uh, she's here uh, from the Mayo Clinic Rochester, um, and she is going to talk about movement is good medicine. We know this, but movement is good medicine for the children also. So Dr. Robotin, welcome, welcome. Tell us a little bit about um, who you are, what you do at the clinic, and then please share your amazing presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I actually have a slide in there. So maybe um, I'll get to that in a second, if that's okay. Um, let me share my screen here and we'll get rolling. All right, can you see my screen okay? Okay, perfect, awesome. All right, so um, thank you so much. And I'm thrilled to be here to talk to you today about a topic I'm, I'm super passionate about and, and that's movement and movement in our kids. So our learning objectives for today, and then I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, I'd like to review physical activity guidelines and the health benefits for children in general. And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, how movement is medicine for kids, even with chronic diagnoses and kids with juvenile idiopathic arthritis, for example, or maybe autism spectrum disorder. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about sports and activity challenges and, and um, potentially the, um, correlation between activity and injury and osteoarthritis as we get older. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a board certified physician in physical medicine and rehabilitation. So at one point I took care of our size people. Um, and um, But my passion is really for the kids. And so um, I went on for a fellowship in pediatric rehabilitation medicine and also sports medicine with a pediatric focus. I'm an engineer by training, so um, kind of you can see maybe based on my board certifications that I'm just an engineer for the body, um, and so that really is <clears throat> kind of my passion. I love thinking about biomechanics and, you know, why maybe somebody's being challenged in a sport or um, even, you know, gosh, what do we need to do for this child's wheelchair to help them be more effective and how they propel it themselves because that's movement, right? Um, uh, I'm an athlete myself. Um, I run marathons. I do triathlons. Um, I'm a former professional ballet dancer. And um, so I understand single sport specialization. Um, and, uh, you know, so some lived history there um, or lived experience, I guess I should say. And um, 
I just have this passion for getting kids moving because I know the power of movement for me over time. Um, I see the power of movement of the children that are in my life. Um, as an engineer, I love adaptive and para sports. Um, you know, again, every every body, not everybody, but every body should be able to move. And um, I have a passion for lifestyle medicine and physical um, activity is one of the pillars in lifestyle medicine. So imagine if you or your child got a D minus in something. Would you do something about it? Would you be upset? Would you say like, ugh? That's not right. Well, that's the grade that the United States received for physical activity in our children. Not good. <laughs> um, about one in four were meeting the physical uh, daily requirements for physical activity before the pandemic. And that actually worsened over the pandemic because we had increased screen time, but now the increased screen time hasn't gone away. And, um, you know, this time in kids' lives, um, childhood and adolescence, it's so critical to developing movement skills, learning healthy habits, establishing that firm foundation that translates into our lifelong health and well-being. And, and we're getting a D minus in this. Um, so I'm here, you know, kind of with a bit of a call to action to us so um, that we can all be examples and provide opportunity and really um, uh, work to um, create these lifelong habits in our in our young people, so that then when they're our age, um, they're they're doing more things. So let's get started. We're going to talk a little bit about physical activity, the what, the why, and the how first. And it's all going to kind of be sprinkled together, but um, we'll we'll get in this next section. We'll get through all of that. So part of the what, um, so there's physical activity guidelines for Americans and you probably heard about that for, for adults. Um, you know, you hear it on the, on the news and hopefully from your physicians, but um, unfortunately the data tells us that we don't talk about it, but um, there's, there's this guideline and it's, there's um, one for, um, uh, for Americans and then there's one from the WHO, the World Health Organization that has um, similar recommendations. And there's a chapter in there, chapter three for active children and adolescents. And um, the information in there is what we're basing that 25% that, that D minus grade on. Um, and again, really this um, chapter is focusing on developing movement skills, learning healthy habits and getting that firm foundation. So, um, we even start talking about it at infancy. Baby is brand new and we're already talking about physical activity. Really? You know, I mean, but it's super important. Um, this actually is not in that physical activity guideline booklet, but it's from a previous recommendation. And I think it's really important to stress that, you know, tummy time for our children on a daily basis while they're awake and supervised is helping um, that those movement patterns start to develop as we um, progress. Um, there's a natural, natural progression to our movement. And um, we have to give kids those opportunities. They can't get in those positions to necessarily start to build those skills. So we have to help them. And um, we, we really need to promote that skill development and movement. So it's, it's our job to give them that opportunity. And um, in our kids ages one to four, we're gonna talk a minute about three to five, but I wanted to make sure that, you know, really we still have to start talking about the kids, the, the one to three-year-olds and getting that, time is about 60 minutes of unstructured physical activity and 30 minutes maybe of structured physical activity. So there's differences, um, you know, structured physical activity might be like riding a bike, things like that, but free play is a huge part of, of being a toddler. Um, and they should be given that time because they, they're gonna develop those movement skills that serve as those building blocks. You know, we go from sitting or rolling, right? To sitting to crawling, to walking, to running, to jumping. And we need to be giving those, uh, giving our kids those opportunities for those skill development. And then that also helps with our bone development with our um, body composition, even from that early age. So in our school age kids, ages three to five, um, we want them to be physically active throughout the day. 60 minutes of physical, um, or three hours, excuse me, of physical activity of all intensities, but really there should be um, a good 60 minutes of that that's um, uh, um, unstructured. And so I think it's hard to kind of, it's hard to conceptualize three hours in a day. You're like, and it's not three hours all at one full swoop, um, but you know, 15 minutes every hour they're awake, they should be moving. If they're not sleeping, they should be moving. 
you know, is really kind of the the moral of the story. Um, really, in the, the kind of guideline is um, um, uh, sixty minutes or no more. Or I guess I um, fifteen minutes of movement an hour, and and really kind of trying to minimize that downtime throughout the day to less than an hour. Um, I guess is the best way to say that. But and again, this is to contribute to bone health. To avoid excess fat, um, to to develop those um, developmental movement patterns that are going to serve our children well when they get older, right? Those kicking skills, hand eye coordination, hand foot coordination, all the things that you take for granted, um, those need to get developed. We need to be given those opportunities. And as we get older, you can see, gosh, okay, the recommendations seem a little bit more complex, right? They do get more complex because um, our bodies are developing, our muscles are developing, our growth plates are developing, our bones are developing. And so then we start to talk about exercise and physical activity in different, um, in different buckets. So what there's the aerobic activity, there's muscle strengthening and bone strengthening. And we'll get to all of those here in a minute um, and what those look like. But we want to encourage activities in um, you know, I have a picture of sports here, but it's not necessarily organized sports. And we'll talk about that. But um, those opportunities for movement that are appropriate for their age, that they enjoy, that offer variety. Um, and as I said, there, there's aerobic fitness, which um, children should be getting 60 minutes um, throughout the day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. Um, as part of that, there should be muscle strengthening at least three days a week and then bone strengthening at least three days a week. And, you know, this does not exclude, like I said um, earlier, um, that movement is for everybody, B-O-D-Y, just the single word, everybody, right? Um, and children and adolescents with disabilities are more likely to be inactive than those without disabilities. And so we should really work, you know, it's, it's and this is part of where um, I feel my, this is my job, this is um, what I love to do, is working with our young um, children to whether they wanna be an athlete or they just wanna move, or they wanna do physical activity. There are people out there in our communities that um, can help identify those opportunities for um, children with disability um, and, and appropriate physical activity for them. And it might take some modification and it might look different than somebody else's, but we the ultimate goal is we want them to move. They need to develop the um, motor skills and motor planning, coordination, bone health, um, body composition, just like everybody else. So really the, the bottom line is that when possible, children and adolescents with disabilities should meet the key guidelines. And if they can't, um, for, for a multitude of reasons, and there, there are many kids who can't, um, we should avoid being, we should avoid inactivity as much as possible and be as active as possible. So what does moderate intensity aerobic activity look like? So I love this talk test on the side because I think it's hard, you know, you can say like, well, there's these, you know, perceived exertion scales and all this kind of stuff. It's like, can you talk or can't you? Um, is kind of how I go about it with kids. Um, so, you know, if you're light, light exercise, your normal breathing, you can sing while you're doing it. You can talk while you're doing it. Um, if it's moderate, you can carry in a conversation. But if I said, you know, sing your favorite Coco Melon song, um, that might be a problem. Um, if um, it's vigorous, you can't really hold that conversation. You might be able to say a few words, but it's not like you can have this big, long conversation. So then what does that activity look like? So in preschool age kids, it might be playing on a playground, might be riding their tricycle, working on their running and walking and jumping and dancing, um, playing catch, getting into gymnastics or tumbling. So if you, you know, these are all things that we can do at home, things we can do in our community. They don't have to necessarily be something that's organized. In our school age kids, you know, uh, this is all about walking, right? Brisk walking is great for our kids. Um, bicycle riding, getting out on, um, getting out hiking, riding a motor or scooter without a motor. Um, you know, <laughs> so I think it's so interesting, you know, and I think about this on my walk into work, like as I see the electric bike people going by, I'm like, does that count or doesn't that? You know, and <laughs> so, um, you know, in my mind, it doesn't, but I'm glad they're out doing something and hopefully they are pedaling. Um, but, you know, it's, it's something to be aware of, right? And as we get older, um, uh, getting into 
maybe more of those organized sports. Um, and I think something that's on this list that I think we also need to give ourselves credit for, like ho housework, yard work, mowing the lawn, um, that's movement, that's physical activity. And, and we need to give ourselves credit for that and, and, and get out and do those things. And then it's a reason to tell your child to mow the lawn. Um, but, um, and then there's video games, some video games that include kind of continuous movement. So, um, you know, I've done like the bowling activity and whatever, and like, it's kind of hard. Like I noticed that I start to get a little, you know, I'm breathing faster. So those are good things. Um, and so those are opportunities with our kids. Vigorous intensity. So, um, this is that gasping for breath. You, you can't hold necessarily conversation. So in a preschool age kid, this might look like the similar activities, but just on a higher level. So maybe it's a little bit more rigorous or maybe they're running a little bit further or swimming a little bit further. Um, uh, so it's kind of intensifying those activities that maybe they're already doing. If we're thinking about school age kids, you know, they're getting more coordinated. So we might um, add in like cross country skiing in the winter um, if you live in a place where that's appropriate um, or possible. But martial arts, um, and love martial arts, such good mind body connection. Like I tell everybody to do martial arts in some capacity. Um, it's just a really great way to kind of get some, some intensity and get your muscle strengthening and your bone strengthening at the same time. Um, and, the, and the same thing holds for adolescents. So getting more into their organized sports, soccer, basketball, swimming, tennis, you know, all the things. Um, and just even playing, you know, getting outside and playing. So what does muscle strengthening look like? So in our preschool age kids, you know, like tug of war, right? Um, they might play tug of war with their dog. You know, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't have to be... It, it, that seems to always happen, right? Um, you know, so those are kind of muscle strengthening activities, playing on playground equipment. And as we get older, starting to do resistance um, exercises with body weight or bands, and then eventually adding weights. Um, you know, we think about, um, it's not just necessarily about growth plates and things like that, but it's actually about having appropriate movement patterns for safe movement with a weight. Um, so it's not that kids can't do things with weight machines and handheld weights. It's just getting the appropriate time when they have that right coordination where it's going to be a safe, um, safe thing for them. Getting kids out, playing on playground equipment, um, doing some kinds of yoga or even in Pilates, those kinds of things are great um, for muscle strengthening. And then on to bone strengthening. So um, bone strengthening are activities that put a force through our bone that promote growth and strength. So you're going to have some kind of impact with the ground. And a lot of this can cross over into muscle strengthening and, and aerobic activity as well. Um, you know, you saw skipping and jumping and everything on the other um, lists, list two. But it's, um, as we get older, we start to think about things that change direction. So you might see kids participating in plyometric exercises. Um, maybe you do those yourself. Like I, I do a lot, I'm, since I run a lot, you know, that's a lot of forward motion. I try to do plyometrics so that I'm working other sides of my body and other directions of my body. And um, that's um, important for our kids as well. And we'll talk about that, why that's important um, eventually, like when we think about osteoarthritis. So I don't know if any of you have seen Hamilton, but um, talk or smile more, talk less or talk, talk less, smile more. I, I think I have it in the right order. So move more and sit less. That's kind of my, my Hamilton, um, uh, uh, ode to Hamilton there. Um, but, you know, sedentary activity is so powerful that um, we, we can't deny it. And I think um, uh, Dr. Lai said in his, the, in the opening lecture, he said, sitting is the new smoking. And um, that's, you know, we see that in, in the WHO, the, the World Health Organization guidelines is actually calling out sedentary behavior. So, and it increased, as I said, our, our grade got worse um, for physical activity during um, the pandemic um, because we replaced school with screen time. And so, um, you know, it's, it, it, given that it's such an important modifiable risk behavior or risk factor that, co that contributes to all cause mortality that we need to call it out. And we need to really say, gosh, we need to focus on this. What does it look like? It's, you know, it's sitting down, it's reclining, it's lying down, lying down, being on our phones all the time, um, being on those tablets, playing video games, even studying technically is sedentary time. Um, you know, obviously, that is important sedentary time because that contributes to academic success. But we'll talk about strategies and what you do, like how can you change some of that and actually get movement into your study time. But it's it, the data is there. The data is there that sedentary behavior um, 
contributes to poor fitness, poor cardio, cardio metabolic, metabolic, metabolic health, excuse me, um, our, our body composition, our moods, our sleep, like everything. And so it's not just our kids, it's us too. Um, so it's, but it's a modifiable risk behavior. So, you know, can we shift our focus from, um, some, you know, and it might be helpful to some people to think, gosh, I need to move more. Well, maybe it's neat. I need to sit less, you know, so find the one that resonates with you and, um, and, and try to try to incorporate that into your kids' lives and our, in your lives as well. Who's ever heard I'm bored. And then the phone comes out, right? Um, so that, you know, that contributes to our physical activity. And um, it's, it's so important that the American Academy of, of um, Pediatrics has come out with recommendations on screen time. And I don't know if you find this surprising or not, but you know, younger than 18 months shouldn't have any screen time. It's you know, not great for um, promoting movement and promoting health and, and our brain development. And no more than an hour per day in um, 18, to, 18 months to four years old. And then in our school age and adolescent um, kids, they really, uh, um, promote the family media use plan, which is great. It's a way to kind of um, focus media priorities uh, and and get what matters most to your family. And, and then I put the link here in the um, on the page because I think it's so important for everybody to say like, when are we going to have screen time? What are we going to use it for? Um, because it's a really a big problem. You know, I, it always breaks my heart when I'm out to a dinner or something and I see a family all on their phones. And, um, you know, so I think we have to have these conversations and, and, and we have to have a conversation rather than be on our phones. Um, so we'll talk about some ways as we go along here to creatively shift that focus to reducing some sedentary time. All right. So to most of us, you know, two minutes or a minute or two minutes of walking doesn't sound like much, but Adolescents and adults that think exercise really doesn't count unless it's intense, you know, no pain, no gain. For a child trying to lose weight, for a child trying to develop motor skills, for a child trying to, you know, build all the things so that they can be a, a, a good, um, healthy adult, um, every little bit counts. So whether it's out jumping rope, you know, going out and playing with your family, taking a short walk to school bus, to, to the school bus, from the school bus to school, climbing up a flight of stairs you know, hit the elevator button for the floor below and climb that stair. And ultimately, you know, if your child gets into better shape, then they start to do even more and more and more. And you can encourage the duration and intensity of the activity, just as we talked about in the um, guidelines, you know, things get more intense over time. So they have to build on these skills. They have to build on the duration. You have to build on the intensity. But the most important thing is move. Like that's, that's kind of the bottom line. So let's get to a little bit more in the why. So being inactive has numerous harmful effects and it's linked to the development of chronic disease. And you know our kids are not just little adults, right? But they're getting adult chronic diseases. Obesity, metabolic disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of these things that are modifiable risk factors for us and we shouldn't be seeing in our kids. So, Thinking about movement as medicine for all ages. You know, this, this chart says health benefits of physical activity for children. I could put all of us on here too. Um, and we're gonna talk a few about, about a few of these in, in particular, but academic performance, our attention and our memory is better when we move. Our brain health, our mood, um, the risk of depression lowers when we move. We build stronger muscles and build endurance. Our blood pressure goes down. We get better aerobic fitness. We can help ward off several chronic diseases like type two diabetes and obesity. We get stronger bones, our blood sugars are better. We have a better healthy weight. We sleep better. We have better self-esteem. Our overall sense of well-being is better. Um, so there's so many positives to um, health benefits to us moving. And I think a few that we don't talk about, you know, we think about, gosh, okay, yep, I'm going to look better. I'm going to, you know, have more endurance. But in children, we have to think about the physical competency. Again, I talked about that hand-eye coordination, the, the foot-eye coordination, um, how we move through our world um, is so important and in, in why movement is, is key to that physical competency. But I think we also have to look at kind of our overall health and well-being. 
So exercise and physical activity can help children self-regulate. You know, some of us need that physical activity to offload stress and anger. And if we huff and puff, you know, through our, through our, through our activity, um, we can reset our body and reset our brain to a calm. You know, I took a walk around the block before this talk to kind of calm my nerves, right? Um, you know, got a little sunshine on my face and, um, you know, it kind of, it did, it helped me breathe. And, and so I actually, before any board exam and even in college, um, and even my mom made me work out in the morning to do some kind of exercise, not work out, but do some kind of exercise in, in, before school every day, um, especially on days I had a test um, because she knew that that was just calming to my system. So you might take a run, a power walk, um, you know, anything like that for, in, you know, in promoting that in our kids. Exercise or physical activity can help build self-esteem. So we all have strengths and weaknesses. And, and those kids who have to work harder in academic subjects might excel in some kind of physical activity, right? So this might be something that gives them so much opportunity to be stronger and um, um, show off some of their skills and, and, and know that they're so good at, at, at something. And, um, you know, so that physical competency um, and it's a positive building block to their, to their self-esteem. It can lift a child's mood. It, so physical activity, and, and you've probably felt this, right? Um, it releases endorphins in our brain, which means that you feel happier, right? I come home from work sometimes, my husband says, you either need a snack or a run. And, you know, like, I, I know that, and I, I know that then, okay, gosh, I probably need a snack and a run, or maybe a movement snack that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. But um, it really can help with depression, anxiety, our mood overall. And like I said, it can really help with sleep, which has a huge impact on our mood. And um, physical activity can help our kids learn social skills and make friends. Um, so team sports are awesome for this. Um, Playing cooperatively gives them the opportunity to learn social skills. They have to learn negotiation. They have to learn sharing, turn taking. Um, you know, it, it, like I said, it's an opportunity to make friends as well and have a positive relationship with other people, which can be a um, protective um, mental health factor as well. So, exercise can and for the physical activity can help us learn. I feel like it's a learning super tool. Um, promotes, uh, it can improve ad academic performance, um, and, and particularly in mathematics and reading. They're the academic topics that are most influenced by physical activity um, in the studies that we have. Um, it can enhance basic cognitive functions related to attention and memory to facilitate learning. So it really um, affects our uh, um, the part of our brain with the executive function. Um, so that's a really powerful area for that. And it can be in small doses and it can be the long-term participation as well. So, you know, those little activity snacks and, and you know, recess, like don't get me started on schools getting rid of um, physical activity because I think that's such an important part of um, learning and attention and um, the development of our kids. So, you know, we really need to kind of think about that. And if we think about um, kind of over the continuum, low physical activity at a primary school age um, relates to less working memory in adolescence. You know, so like you're just, you're building on that foundation um, for, for good learning and for good um, academic performance and just good cognitive function with attention and memory. So thinking about physical activity and our mental health um, of, our, of our kids. So it, it's really interesting because if you look at where physical activity starts to dip in adolescence, it's when mental health challenges start to, to increase. And so, you know, we're seeing that increase there and the decrease in, in um, uh, physical activity, but we know that that's such a powerful tool in our mental health. And even our young people will say, yeah, I know physical activity is a, is a good way to help me with my mental health and, and to um, treat mental health issues. And it's, it's a non-stigmatizing tool, which I think is really powerful, but yet we don't do it. You know, it, we're not giving them the opportunities. We're overscheduling. We're not, you know, there's just so many, so many things, but the, the data tells us that moderate to vigorous physical activity and even light intensity interventions can um, decrease depression symptoms, can reduce our anxiety, can decrease stress, can improve our mood. So um, I think you're seeing a theme here, but um, it's really powerful. And our kids with ADHD, with attention deficit hyper, hyperactivity disorders, um, 
there, the data tells us that this is that physical activity can improve their co cognitive function. If they go and get some exercise, they'll come back into a classroom and have more sustained attention. And if you really challenge them with complex mind body things like martial arts, gymnastics, um, ice skating, ballet, they even excel even more. Um, so kind of really challenging that brain. Um, and, and what kind of happens in our brains um, when we are moving, we're getting growth of new nerve cells, all those endorphins and good neuro, neurotransmitters start to get emitted. And we actually have blood vessel adaptation and all of that as well. So that's part of the reason why we're seeing the power of physical activity in our cognition and in our, in our mood and attention. And our individuals with autism spectrum disorder, they are at an even greater risk of having medical and psychiatric illnesses um, kind of combined. Um, so um, obesity, cardiovascular disease compared to our general population, and they have lower physical fitness scores. And so that you know, correlates to strength and endurance and um, uh, bone health. Um, and so physical activity is a modifiable risk factor for them. We know that it improves their gross motor skills. It can improve their skill-related fitness, improve social functioning, and improve that muscular strength and endurance. So in chronic conditions, you know, I think um, there's many people who, you know, gosh, I have this, so I can't, my kid has this, so they can't, I can't exercise, or they can't be physically active. And um, I, I think it's safe to say that nearly every child can find an appropriate level of physical activity. The big thing is we wanna make sure they can participate successfully without frustration. So it builds their self-esteem, it builds their confidence, but we should encourage every child to be as active as possible. And many chronic conditions have few, if any, restrictions. Um, you know, if you think about a child with asthma, you know, you have to have doctor's guidelines and you need to have things in place, but it doesn't mean they shouldn't move. A child with seizures, you need to have an action plan in, in place and sports appropriate or act physical activity appropriate to that child, depending on um, when and how they have their seizures, um, but they should move. A child with um, scoliosis should absolutely move. Um, so, you know, a kid with heart disease, with um, high blood pressure, again, talk to the cardiologist, talk to the pediatrician, but they should move because we know that all of the, I just gave you a hundred reasons why um, they should move. Um, it all applies. And specifically, and Dr. Agarwal talked about this in her talk on the 31st of May, I think it was, um, you know, that um, in her experience with rheumatoid arthritis, and so, you know, kind of thinking about this in juvenile idiopathic arthritis, um, this isn't your excuse not to move. And, um, you know, it's, it be, she, I, I wrote down her words, be kind to your body if it's inflamed but it doesn't mean don't move. And I really loved how she said that. Um, and, and you know the, the benefits of movement in JIA are the same as they are in an, an adult with RA, that we have to strengthen the muscles around the joints to protect the joints. It can improve energy. When we move, we have improved mood, which can improve your pain management and quality of life. We have to keep that range of motion of joints. Um, and so that movement will help with that. And then um, Dr. Esser talked about like weight management in joints, right? Um, that, you know, we have to, the more weight we have, even as a child on our joints, it makes it harder. Water-based exercise is sometimes a really good thing for children with JIA. It takes some of that uh, pressure off the joints and they can feel better movement. They can actually get more range of motion. Um, it, it's a um, really good tool when they're exercising in the time of a flare, but talk to your healthcare provider, you know, um, call me. <laughs> like, I think it's, you know, we're, we're out there and we want to talk about this. So um, it's really important to um, not use a, a diagnosis or a condition as an opportunity to move. So I hope you're taking away that movement is for everybody and everyone, um, and it can look different for everybody. Um, okay, now the how. You're like, yeah, 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 whatever. Like, I know I need to get this much and, you know, um, how are we going to get our kids to move? But, you know, I think we really have to get back to the basics, right? Taking a walk, playing on um, jungle gym equipment, get out the hula hoop. I don't even know if they make hula hoops anymore, but they do. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, go in the garage and like kick around a ball. Like I used to hit tennis balls up against our garage door. My mom hated it, but like 
then I painted the garage door. Um, you know, I, and so, and that was more physical activity, right? But, you know, there's just ways to do this. And, you know, it's so interesting to me when I ask a patient what they do for physical activity, a lot of times they say, well, I don't play sports. That wasn't my question. And, you know, so there's such a correlation between playing sports and, and physical activity. And, and so I, you know, trying to dispel that and we can dispel that as examples and in our conversations. And in all of this, I wanna really, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that there's barriers, right? I am not blind that there are barriers to physical activity. There's demographic barriers, there's personal barriers, there's social barriers, there's financial barriers, there's transportation barriers. Um, there's environmental barriers and, and, feeling, and feeling safe in your environment, um, just to name a few. Um, and, and those are even more profound for um, children with disability. And so um, I, I want to acknowledge that that's for real. And that if, that if you're experiencing that, if that's the reason that's stopping someone from moving, talk to your healthcare provider, talk to your social worker, talk to a, a school resource person. Um, and we'll talk about some other resources, but let us help remove those barriers if at all possible so that we can move and, and, and get back to the basics. So I've used the word movement snacks a little bit. Um, I don't know if you heard me say that um, earlier, but um, you know, thinking about that sedentary time or thinking about how to, um, how to get movement into your day. So I actually have a timer on my phone and all of my nieces and nephews have this timer now too. Um, that you set the timer for how much time you're going to be sedentary, maybe studying or working or whatever, and then it goes off and then you have a, another timer that tells you to move. And so maybe you get up and walk, you know, you do squats. You, um, I think Dr. Esther was talking about having like a TRX in his bedroom or something. And like, <laughs> it was <laughs> like, oh my gosh. But you know, so those, all those little things like run up and down the stairs, go outside and play catch. Um, what are those, what are those times? And I call those movement snacks, but there's also a different thing on movement snacks. So if you think, gosh, I'm kind of hungry, I'm going to go grab some potato chips. Well, maybe that could be time for a movement snack. Um, you know, and that's, so that I'm talking about this for us, but I'm also talking about it for our kids, you know, so it's, you know, getting up and like I said, doing some squats, taking a walk around the block, um, all these little opportunities for movement. So next time you think about a snack, think, do I need a movement snack, a snack snack, or some hydration? Those could be things to think about. And our children are so influenced by the exercise habits and the activity level of the people that surround them. And this is a great um, outline of ways to get started with um, parents helping kids move, but we can apply this, you know, whether you're a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or a teacher or a friend, um, uh, this is from the healthychildren.org from American uh, from um, the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I think there's some great um, great tips on here. So like I've said, talk to your doctor um, if, if you're worried about um, what could be possible for your child for their for, for their physical activity. But have fun. Get the family out there. Choose something that's developmentally appropriate. We talked about that earlier. You know, you're not going to be doing um, you know weightlifting in a, in a toddler. Um, but maybe you get on a bicycle or a tricycle. Plan ahead. Um, it, you know, I think this is something, you know, just like the timer I showed you, maybe you actually, it, a lot of families have kind of schedules of the day. Why isn't exercise physical activity on the schedule of the day? You know, maybe it should be. Keeping those active toys around, um, you know, so yep, maybe you have a video game controller, but there better be a soccer ball or, you know, whatever the, that may be for you. Um, and your family be a role model. Like I said, if they, if children see you being active, um, they are more likely to be active in at that time, and also more likely to be active as they get older. Um, so these these habits translate into adulthood. Um, play with them. You know, like this is a way for you to move too. Um, set those limits. Get that that media get that media plan potentially. Um, like I said, make exercise and don't overdo it. You know, starting small. If your child isn't ready for 60 minutes throughout the course of a day, you start with five minutes and then you build because it keeps getting better and better. We all know you can't just go from running, you know, couch to marathon, right? Or couch to 5K, couch to anything. Um, we have to take time and be kind to our bodies. 
So I love this infographic. Um, I hand this out all the time. Um, it's from the American Heart Association. And I'm like, put this on your refrigerator. You do however many you want in a day. These are movement snacks, right? And um, if we had more time, I would make us, I was going to make us do number 13, arm circles, because everybody could do that sitting. So if you feel like doing arm circles right now, go ahead. Um, exactly. So we're, <laughs> I can't see you all, but <laughs> it, you know, you do 30 seconds of arm circles forward and backwards, it's hard. But um, what I love about this is, um, you know, it's, it's not quite a month, but um, checking something off maybe each day and then having a little celebration at the end. Um, or uh, then taking this and making a new version of it for your family in activities that you like. Like, how can you do these little movement snacks and um, um, have some reward at the end? You know, it's like a sticker chart. Every time you get one done, you get a sticker on it, and then maybe there's something to celebrate at the end. Great ideas for the winter. Um, you know, get some exercise videos out. I love hip hop public health. I share this with my um, patients and families all the time because these are these are two videos. Um, snippets from hip hop public health. These ones are from the two minute version um, or the two minute little snippets. And if you notice there's somebody sitting in these, you know, so it shows that everybody can move and um, they're really fun and they're embarrassing. And I usually actually incorporate these into um, um, our resident didactics. So these are our movement snacks and everybody has to have their cameras on or if we're in person, we're standing up and or we're seated you know, where, whatever your ability is, we're moving. Put your favorite song on and dance. You don't have a dance party at home. That was on the um, kids move as well. And then think about your community resources. This is not an inclusive list. This is just ideas, right? So um, getting together with Parks and Rec, um, thinking about what trails are available in your area. There's so many rails to trails in our um, country, which is awesome. Um, I don't remember how many miles there are, but there's a lot of miles. You know, getting to a state park, um, uh, Miracle League Baseball um, is baseball for kids that need adaptation. Special Olympics, there's so many ways to participate um, and some of them are even free. You know, so again, it, thinking about what those barriers are and, and reaching out to your healthcare providers to um, help reduce those barriers. Okay, so on to sports. So you have, I haven't talked much about organized sports, right? Um, because I really want, again, to, to, you know, that, that question always is in my mind that when I say to kids, you know, what do you do for physical activity? Oh, I don't play sports. Like, so I didn't want the focus to be that this whole time. So um, thinking about organized sports, it, organized sports are important. It's a powerful tool, um, a powerful tool for so many things, right? Teamwork. We've already talked about this. Identity, social connection, leadership, negotiation, learning, winning, and losing. Um, cooperation, you know, you can't, I don't, if anybody's crude, you cannot um, row a boat and um, get out of sync or else people don't like you. <laughs> Usually end up wet. Um, you know, physical activity requirements, this is one way to make them, right? Um, and so really, really, really powerful tool. And there were two specific questions um, that, that um, wanted, people wanted to, to hear about. And one of them was sports specialization. And what sports specialization? So that's engaging in a sport for at least three seasons a year, exclusive of other sports, um, before the age of 12. So really kind of getting um, uh, that single, participating or training for that single sport year round. So like I said, I was a ballet dancer and actually I, I violated this, full disclosure. Um, you know, I, but I think it, we didn't have as much awareness um, maybe at that time um, of what we were doing uh, or kind of of the, of the challenges. Um, and I also was closed-minded, um, you know, so it wasn't that my parents didn't give me those opportunities. It was just, I was very close-minded to it. And so I understand that. But the risk of early sports specialization, you know, physical activity obviously is beneficial for us, but we can increase the risk of injury. We increase the risk of burnout. We can decrease their self-esteem because they get injured and then they get out of their sport and then they've lost their identity. And it actually impacts future participation in physical activity because, you know, whether that's kind of what somebody really hung on to as their, their physical activity was their sport. Um, and this is really, we're seeing trends of um, increased duration, increased intensity, earlier specialization, year round training. And this is especially true in our girls um, because, you know, sports have become more and more and more prevalent for girls, um, which, you know, back 
Title IX was what back in the seventies, I think. But um, you know, it's just even more and more opportunities, and you know, more professional sports for women. And I think there's becoming more sports equity. Not um, we're not there yet, but um, that's a whole nother talk. Um, but um, we're seeing the trends of of girls um, doing more. And that's leading for all of our athletes into overuse injuries. And what an overuse injury is kind of a repeated activity and a, a micro trauma or a micro stress on a bone or a ligament or a joint and um, not giving it enough time to heal. So you've heard about like Tommy John syndrome for elbows in, in baseball pitchers. Um, if you think about different sports, so um, an overhead athlete might have trouble with their shoulder or their elbow. Um, a, a, ballet dancer, a gymnast, a figure skater, um, even some football players, extension sports, um, getting fractures in their back. Um, you might've heard of that. Um, thinking about growth plates in kids. So overuse injuries can be a precursor to osteoarthritis potentially. Um, so we really have to think about this and, and how do you identify an overuse injury in, an, in a young athlete? Um, you know, sometimes they're not going to tell you, they, they might not even know. But if they're complaining of pain that isn't, a isn't tied to an acute injury, you know, they didn't get hit with something, they didn't fall, they didn't, um, you know, there was no reason for the injury. Um, and it improves, it gets worse with activity and improves with rest, might be an overuse injury. Swelling, maybe an overuse injury. Changes in former technique. All of a sudden, I was an overhead thrower and now I'm a side thrower. Hmm. You know, like what, what changed in my mechanics? that made me have to do that. And it could be an overuse injury, decreased interest in practice. They might not even know they're in pain, you know, but things just aren't going as well. So they're not having as much fun. It could be an overuse injury. So, um, you know, we really want to focus on delaying specialization in a single sport for as long as possible. Um, maybe participating in one team at a time. You know, there's so many opportunities to do your high school team and the travel team and the whatever other team. And so, you know, that, that makes it really hard. Um, I think this is a really good one um, to think about too, is no more time on an organized sport hours per week than their age. So if you have a 12 year old kid, they shouldn't be in organized sports more than 12 hours a week. Now tell that to a gymnast, um, you know, who's working, I, I, you know, so it's, this is really, there's a lot of conversation that has to happen and a lot of, um, you know, I think our, we've changed in how we view sports and, and um, the, the need to, you know, start to be perfectionists from, from early on that makes it really hard. Um, but those are, those are some really important rules of thumb and getting two days of rest per week, at least. Um, we need that time for our bodies to recover. No professional athlete, I say this to kids all the time, no professional athlete practices every day. You know, so I can't say no, but I, I, many, most, you know, because they know their body needs time to recover. So we really need to focus on that and taking those regular breaks, playing other sports um, is essential to skill development, injury prevention, burnout. Many, many, many professional athletes played multiple sports in high school. So um, I think that's important to, to keep in mind. And then thinking about um, osteoarthritis in youth sports. Um, so there's a wide variety of, you know, internal factors, right, that can cause osteoarthritis, our, our sex, our genetic predisposition, our adiposity, but there's external factors too, joint injury, um, excess weight um, that, that increase our risk for, for osteoarthritis. And, and based on the available evidence that we have, um, there may be a link between youth sports injuries and osteoarthritis. Um, that's, there's no, there's no kind of slam dunk that says, yes, this is for sure. But I love this infographic and kind of, um, thinking about over the continuum, what could contribute to, um, arthritis over time. So if we think about our littles monitoring their hip development, um, and so again, giving kids those opportunities to be in good positionings for crawling and all of that, but also kind of the, the actual, um, manifestation of hip dysplasia that can occur regardless of, of movement. Um, and thinking about our, our older kids, making sure that um, they're getting um, appropriate sports-related injury prevention. Um, so we know that the majority of knee injuries occur in adolescence, and we can reduce those injuries during that time if we actually um, look at exercise programs that incorporate neuromuscular control and exercise and strength training. So, you know, I told you about that I do a lot of lateral work um, 
because I'm a kind of an inline athlete right now. And so I have to do a lot of lateral work to make sure that the muscles that help support knee health for me are strong. And so there's um, protocols for um, some of our like female soccer players on um, strengthening the, your hip muscles and your, your glute muscles and your core to then um, that translates into lower risk of knee injury when you're playing soccer, for example. Um, the sad thing is it's not always part of our sports participation programming and training. Um, and so all the resources are out there and there's even like, follow this protocol. You know, and so there's lots of tools out there for us. We just have to use them. And thinking about our weight over time too, you know, if you look on here, it's um, making sure that we're preventing overweight and inactivity here. Um, our data tells us that children and adolescents with um, excess weight are five times more likely to be overweight or obese as an adult. And as we heard from Dr. Esser a couple weeks ago, that effective weight on our joints can contribute to osteoarthritis. So there's modifiable risk factors that we have that we are in control of that we could that we could really um, make an impact on that over time. So my call to action, let's get better grades, right? Um, let's just not imagine us getting a better grade on our physical activity, let's do it. And, you know, I think, I, I hope you're kind of taking away that doing a little bit at a time, you know, this doesn't have to be 60 minutes all in one full swoop. And if you're starting out at five minutes, start out at five minutes and work up to the 60. Um, progress, not perfection. I think that's such a huge, that's a kind of a mantra of my life right now uh, is, um, you know, we got to move forward. I, so many kids say, well, I can't do that because I'm not good at it. Well, how do you get good at something? You do it, right? Um, or you find something that you are good at and really try to excel at that. Um, the power of our community and modeling, we can influence how our kids move. It's such a powerful thing. Um, and so hopefully you've gotten some tools for that. And there's no single, single formula. Make it fun, make it interesting, make it age appropriate, make it meaningful. Um, so there's so many opportunities um, for us to, to get better grades. So let's make physical activity a lifelong goal or a life, lifelong physical activity a goal and um, give us give our kids the best medicine um, that we can ever give them for that lifetime of health. And we are examples. And so um, hopefully you even found a few tools for yourself today. So with that, um, thank you. And um, I'd open it up for questions. I can end my show here. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I really did appreciate the Hamilton reference. <laughs> Excellent. More, oh, with the doc. More, yep. sit less. Um, and yes, um, you know, we were talking about different things in the community. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Lai does the walk with the doc. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's really important. Uh, a great opportunity for people locally uh, to be able to participate. Uh, and again, you know, at movement, let's just let's let's get started somewhere. Yeah. Pick out your favorite song and dance, you know, like mm -hmm. nobody's watching. <laughs> yep. uh, so I'd like to open to questions, uh, comments. Um, if everyone would pop back on their screen, that would be great. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Lai. Hi, May. Hi, Al. Leticia's there somewhere. I know where she is. She's up the hill from me. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the wonderful information. Yeah. I just wonder, um, in your practice in the uh, past uh, several years, um, what is a major health uh, concern you have seen that's been growing in a pediatric area? Yeah, so um, I think um, in the kids that I see with disability, I see weight gain. Mm. So, um, you know, which affects so many things. It affects their ability to um, potentially do their transfers on their own if they're a if they're wheelchair user for their, for their ambulation, for their movement, for their mobility. Um, they're having a harder time getting from their chair, their, you know, a couch or a chair or their bed into their wheelchair. Um, it's, it's harder on their caregivers when they're trying to help them if, they're, if, they're, if they have um, more body mass. Um, so I think that's that's a really big one. It's skin concerns with that. Like it, the the list goes on and on of when we start to see kids that um, are are putting on weight um, with disability. Um, the kids that I see in sports, you know, I see a lot of overuse. Um, 
lot, the shoulder seems to kind of be something that's um, recently um, kind of rise. And it might be, it, I think it's probably part of it is referral bias um, in terms of who, where, who, what people are sending to me. But, um, you know, kind of thinking about the shoulder and the movement mechanics and, you know, getting kids getting an injury early on. And then I'm seeing some of these kids a couple years later and um, really having bad biomechanics. They've dropped out of their sport. They're, you know, now having depression. Um, so I think those overuse injuries are real. And they really affect our, our affect our young kids. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, since you emphasize a lot of lifestyle medicine, you also uh, help um, grow the lifestyle medicine program uh, at Mayo Clinic. Yeah. So how did you incorporate? I know when it, when you mentioned about overweight, how did you incorporate? Uh, you know, other lifestyle medicine principles, especially nutrition, as you mm -hmm. see the overweight. Yeah, so um, that's something that I'm really, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, so, you know, I think I, I always start the conversation by what's your favorite food? And, um, you know, a lot of times it's like Cheetos and pudding and um, like, oh, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, then I try to ask them, what's your favorite vegetable? What's your favorite fruit to try to identify or try to start this conversation? Um, it's something that I'm, I, I, I will fully admit I'm not great at yet to like, because we don't, you know, how much time do we have? So it's actually something that I'm saying, gosh, I want to see you back a little bit sooner because, um, uh, I want to have a conversation about this the next time, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm starting to kind of, um, in, in engineering land, grease the skids that, um, you know, uh, we're going to talk about this mm -hmm. and it's something that's really important. And, you know, we know that, um, weight management is not just exercise. We know the, the power of, of, um, nutrition in that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Questions. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, let's just uh, front on the chat. Uh, Leticia said, thank you. Um, talking about early sports specialization was really helpful. She has six children in wrestling mm -hmm. um, and her daughter's physician mentioned this at her last visit. So now, uh -huh. now uh, Leticia knows more. So thank you for that. Thank Great. you for the comment, Leticia. Um, I, I had a question. So sure. I was just down in Mexico at a mission that um, specializes in a school for children with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And like it's a mixed school. So like 30% of the children have disabilities and the rest of them don't have disabilities or obvious disabilities. But um, I noticed something that they did in their day was every 45 minutes, they took a 10 minute activity break. Yeah. And I wondered uh, <laughs> how common is that or how uncommon is that? Great question. A, thank you for um, going on that mission trip and serving those those children. Um, and uh, I don't know the exact data. I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, I feel pretty comfortable saying it's pretty rare. Mm. But those are movement snacks, right? That's the timer. That's, you know, like it's so powerful and kids focus so much better if you let them move, you know, like and I, I have some teacher friends who, you know, they can tell when, you know, this is starting to happen. They're like, okay, everybody out, you know. <laughs> um, and then all of a sudden they sit back down and the math problem goes better, mm. you know, or whatever it is, um, it, you know, so gosh, it's, it's so powerful. And yet, you know, there's so many barriers to that. Like we got to get so much of this different amount of time of something in and, and pass these tests and you know, so there's a lot of things that kind of create barriers for us to really incorporate that. But it's also flipping, like, you know, if I, if I don't exercise in the morning, my day isn't as good. My mood's worse, you know, so like taking that time rather than getting all stressed out and like, I got to get in early to do this and that and the other thing, I'm going to do it faster. If I actually take that 10 minutes or 15 minutes, say, you know, and do something. Mm -hmm. I love it. I know in my, in my world, I talk to my clients, we call it the Pomodoro method. Yes. Yep. Exactly That's the timer that. I used to. Like, I didn't know if I could mention that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who, I don't know who came up with the name, uh, Mr. Pomodoro, Mr. Tomato. Um, and it's amazing when clients will say, well, I don't have time to do that. Um, once they start doing it, 
they, when they miss it, they, they know, like their body is telling them, ah, you need mm -hmm. to do something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, doing this for, you know, our kids, we need to make sure that we're doing it for ourselves. So then yeah. we know we can say to our children, you know, I do this, you know, this is how I incorporate it in my day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Leticia says, I taught seventh graders for a homeschool co-op for years and every 50 minutes. They had, yeah. Perfect. Thank you for doing that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so, I, I would just have another comment. Um, well, you have a, such a wonderful information, which I wish that every parent and, and kids, they can get uh, information. Um, now, where do you normally have your residents or the physician team to share this kind of information in the public? As a uh, Elon actually make a suggestion that um, would have you considered to connect with uh, like Olmsted County Public Health um, to incorporate um, some of this uh, activity and to address the concern of the obesity as you know as a PMMR physician. Yeah, yeah. I think it's something that we can absolutely do a better job on. Um, and you know, so we get out there some. Um, you know, I think time again is always the challenge, right? Um, but um, through, you know, I try to kind of start early in like in medical school when I um, teach some of the musculoskeletal course, you know, and so I start to actually have these conversations with our medical students. So then hopefully it's translating, you know, I mean, it, you need more than just that little mm -hmm. snippet of information, but, um, uh, you know, being examples like, um, I volunteer, we volunteer a lot at um, different activities throughout the community, like wheelchair basketball through EA oh, Therapeutics, nice. um, sled hockey. Um, we do conversations there. At, and so these are all children that have disability, but you know, I would love to get more into the school system and things like that. Like those are things that are absolutely on the to-do list, but I'm not oh, hours in the day, right? <laughs> Okay. If, if they're if they're on your list, eventually you will get them done. It, it, totally. I have a thing that says I'm in my room or in my office right here that says, um, "Oh, where is it? Um, oh shoot, it's the things on your to do list." I can't find the sticky note right now because there's too many sticky notes. But um, you know, the things <laughs> um, <laughs> things on your to do list are the things that are going to get done. Um, so, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I would just add that it's actually also on the other side, the Olympic County Public Health should really also broadcast what you do. And I'm on their communication team right now. Oh. They're looking into improving, improving their communication process. The thing that they need to do is inventory you know, all the existing assets within the community that would That's, lead to better health. That. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to include you know, your asset, your, your capability in that inventory. Yeah. That's a big question that I always have. You know, people say, well, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. And right. um, I, I have an adaptive sports clinic and a lot of the children, the referral that I get that are kids are like, where do we start? You know, and I, that always kind of breaks my heart a little bit that, you know, like the community and there's so, there, there is a lack of community resources um, all over the country um, for, um, for kids with disability. But um, just in general, you know, like I'm always like, let's, let's pull up the parks and rec web website and see what's on here that maybe would be interesting to you or um you know the the 25 ways to get moving maybe one of those things is going to spark something oh my gosh i love to dance you know like okay then let's translate that into something else um you know so it's finding that thing that that movement that resonates with a child um that will really make it stick absolutely I love it. And for adults too, find something. Yeah, totally. That right. and All of this applies to you. <laughs> I know. I just want to keep reminding you, you know, I know we're talking about our kids, but you know, we have, you know, we're, we're their best um, examples. Mm -hmm. The data so, tells us that. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. um, any, let's say uh, we're at just, just gone uh, one Oh six. So we should uh, wrap up here. Um, Sorry. I put us over. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. I think questions are really important. Yeah, you know, after you do a presentation, a comment, a, a question is always really important. It really helps people who haven't participated really kind of uh, dig in a little deeper. Yeah. Um, and Al, free, free, feel free to reach out to me if I can, you know, like this is to, to May's point, like, you know, making these connections, right? And getting the conversation yeah. started. Absolutely. I'm glad you, you can guys get my contact info from May or, or um, Denise or anybody. Yeah. Sounds great.
Well, Dr. Robertson, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, hopefully this is just, you know, the first of many conversations that, you know, that we have here um, in Rochester and uh, that we can share with the, the local community and the community at large um, to, to get our kids moving and to get moving with them. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of you who are listening here today, uh, and for those who are watching the replay, we really do hope that um, this information was interesting and life changing for you. Uh, if you haven't seen the first four uh, weeks of presentations, please go to rochesterclinic.org and watch those presentations. Um, Dr. Robinson today mentioned a few of them. Um, she referenced a few, and each one of them, I mean, they're, 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 the topics are amazing. They build on one another. And I know you'll find you know, tidbits in each one that you can incorporate into uh, your daily life uh, so you can move better, feel better, um, and really live with uh, vibrance uh, and energy. Uh, so last uh, next week, join us again, please. Uh, this will actually, next week will actually be our last of this, uh, this series. And our speaker, uh, it will be June 28th. So Wednesday, June 28th, 12 p.m. Central Time will be Dr. Joel Furman. Uh, for anyone who has ever been in the uh, plant-based world, Dr. Furman's name comes up quite often. He's a seven-time best-selling author, uh, really interesting guy. And uh, I would uh, encourage everyone, uh, if you're listening, uh, to join us live uh, for that presentation. Uh, and where can you do that? You can go to Eventbrite uh, and find the, uh, the link, or you can go right to rochesterclinic.org, sign up right there for next week's presentation, listen to our uh, past presentations, and really take your health back into your hands and take that next step. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here live. Thank you for our uh, listeners who are watching the replay. Have a great day, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.